Welcome. My name is Julio Tino. I'm the dean of McCormick. I'm delighted to have the lecture that you see in the screen today by Nobel laureate Danny Sheckman. I'm delighted for several reasons, okay? My intro will be sort of generic. You will get bored if besides what I'm going to say, I would recite part of the resume of Professor Sheckman, so I'm going to leave that to David Seidman. So I'm delighted for at least two reasons. One is I'm completely of the opinion that entrepreneurship can play the role that is indicated in the title of this talk. And even though I think you made similar remarks in the United Nations with this topic, uh, I'm not second guess what you will say here now, except that I completely agree with the title. This is something that changed drastically in schools of engineering over the last 10, 12 years. Uh, is something that is differentiated countries now. Um, Israel is uniquely positioned in this regard. Singapore, Finland, Israel, both really well-run places, rely on innovation, but in terms of entrepreneurship and IP per capita, Israel is at the top. The second reason that I'm delighted about this is because of the connections that we have in between Northwestern and material science in Israel. Uh, we are delighted that there is a new department that emerged in Tel Aviv after one of the faculty there spent some time here in material science and then they decide to form a department. And there are multiple connections that we have with them. In fact, there will be a workshop and we're planning to send about 16 people from here to there, followed by some other exchange. So I'm delighted for those two reasons. Entrepreneurship has been something that is high in the scale of things of what we want to do here. Uh, and the second one is material science being represented in here. And I'm really honored to have you uh, accept our invitation to come to Northwestern and deliver two lectures. Welcome. Well, it's a great personal privilege for me to introduce uh, Dan Sheckman, or Danny as everyone calls him, uh, for this talk because I first met Danny when he was a PhD student at the Technion during the 1969-70 uh, academic year, and he had done a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering at the Technion because there was no undergraduate program in materials engineering, and then he went on to do his two, uh, two degrees, MS and PhD, and he was one of the first Israelis to do electron microscopy on materials as opposed to the life scientists at that time who had dominated the electron microscopy, the electron microscopy scene in Israel. And we actually wrote a short paper together, which is lost in the oblivion of time. And um, two, <laughs> two short pages. And I've kept in, I'm kept in contact with Danny all this time over the years. And it was really exciting for me while I was at home doing my uh, exercise on a, um, on a Nordic track, or a, I forget, maybe it was a bicycle at that time, stationary bike, and I'm listening to NPR, and I says, Danny Sheckman wins the Nobel Prize for chemistry. And I said, well, and then I, it, it sunk in, it sunk in. Well, he finally won it because he made this discovery in 1982. He published his first paper in 1983, and he persevered, he persevered. And his name, Dan, the etymology of it means to be judged. And he was judged for a very long time, but he persevered. And he finally got the Nobel Prize in 2011. So it took a while. I think the other thing I wanted to say is that Dan, about 27 years ago at the Technion, he started a course on how do you start a company for students. 
and his en enrollment in that course, the first time he offered it, he brought in people from industry, Israeli industry at the time. He had 600 students, and that made a lot of his colleagues very upset with him. But he persevered there again, and it's been taught for 27 years, this course, um, and on entrepreneurship, really, how to start up a company. And he also has a very strong interest in science education for very young children, which he's been involved with in Israel. And fairly recently, um, he was involved with three other Nobel laureates in chemistry in Israel on revamping the program that young people get in chemistry, particularly in the south of Israel, where there were almost no students studying chemistry. And once again, he persevered and he's been successful. So I think it fits his name and his personality both. Dan, please. <laughs> It works. Uh, so I just want to add one more thing uh, regarding the introduction, which is the most important thing to know about me. And you, you never mentioned it, Hank Price. And that is that I have 10 grandchildren and four children and one wife. <laughs> now you know the most important things about me. OK, technological entrepreneurship, the key to all peace and prosperity. And as um, you just said, you have heard from Professor Seidman. Uh, it is a class that I have started at the Technion 27 years ago, and it is going on ever since. And it's a large class, one of the largest Technion classes, between 600 and 300 students, depending on the hall that I'm using, uh, each year. And uh, by now, if you make the math, if you do the numbers, you see that I have about uh, 10,000 Technion graduates who are engineers and scientists that took my class over that period of time. Now, for a small country like Israel, 10,000 engineers and scientists is a large number of people that were encouraged to open startups and were taught how to do it. So this is why I feel um, competent to talk about this subject. I have been talking about technological entrepreneurship around the world for quite a few years, and in fact, Half of my presentations around the world, and there are about 100 every year, are about um, technological entrepreneurship, and the rest is uh, the science that I will talk about uh, tomorrow. So what is technological entrepreneurship? What, what is the definition of it? And uh, there are many uh, detailed and complex definitions, and I've chosen the following one. It's an establishment of a new technology venture. Uh, you have to establish it. Uh, it has to be new, it has to be technology, and it's a venture. Some win, many lose. Most startups fail. But it's okay, we'll talk about it. So this, this is it, this is the subject of uh, my talk. So why is technological entrepreneurship so important for the well-being of societies, countries, and the world? Let us look at the world uh, today. The, it's, it's a very complex world, it's a very agitated world, and let's mention two phenomena. Number one, and you'll be surprised to hear that, we live in a world of peace. It doesn't look this way, but there is not a single war between two countries today. Countries don't fight each other. The bloodshed in many countries are between fractions of the society, tribal, tribal wars, which are horrible. And um, the, one of the results of these horrible wars are streams of refugees. Millions of people leave today their homes to move to other countries. Many of them flee to other Arab countries or other African countries, and many of them just go to Europe. They sail to Europe, they swim to Europe, they go legally, they go illegally, and Europe, especially Italy, is, is uh, under a huge wave of refugees. This is one phenomenon. These refugees don't have any hope in their countries. Another phenomenon is the following. There is a population growth, and there was fear in the past, and Malthus, many of you know of him, 
predicted that there will be not enough food for everybody in a world in which the population grows dramatically and there will not be enough food and people will die of hunger. That doesn't happen. Because Malthus could not foresee the technological revolution, the industrial revolution, and mainly the agricultural revolution. We have enough food for everybody. In fact, we eat too much, most of us. And you, it seems that everything is fine. And the population in the world who grows now at a certain rate, that rate will decrease. And it is expected in the year, or about there, about uh, 2050, the growth will reach zero. Okay? No more growth. We will reach a certain number of people, and that will be it. So food is no problem. So that's good news, right? But if you see where the population is decreasing and where the population is increasing to make this statistical balance, you'll see something interesting. In the developed world, there are not enough children per family. In the Far East, Taiwan, Korea, and so on, there's about between 1 and 1.25 children per, per family on the average. Now, if you have one child per family on the average, it means that every generation will be half of the previous generation. You don't have to study high math to realize that. So, within two generations, population drops to a quarter. And two generations is nothing. It's our lifetime and less than that. So, these countries have great problems. The United States is doing fairly well on this scale, it's just, just about balanced. On the other hand, countries that cannot feed their people, mainly in Africa, have many children per woman. Niger has more than seven children per woman on the average. Yes, more than seven children per woman on the average. Mali, 6.3. I will not give you the whole, the whole list, but these countries cannot feed their population. And because of that, people are angry, and because of that, people fight each other, and we come again to the waves, waves of refugees. How can these countries solve the problem? And entrepreneurship is one way of doing it in a very good way. And I will talk about not entrepreneurship in general, but technological entrepreneurship in particular, after all, we are in this university, and uh, I come from a technological university too. Okay, so this is why. Let's look at, a, at a, let's have a case study of one country, uh, South Korea. I'm now on sabbatical in South Korea, so I know something about this country. And let's talk about the um, demographic pyramid. This is the demographic pyramid of Israel, not of South Korea. If you look at this pyramid, we call it pyramid because it looks like pyramid, right? In Israel, it looks like pyramid. So it means what you see here is uh, the, this is the number of people and this is the age group, okay? So and each bar is four years. So zero to four, five to nine years old, 10 to 14 years old, and so on and so forth. So you see that there are many young children and less and less and less and less as the population ages. So we have many children and very few old people. This is a young society in Israel. So if you look for workforce in the future, it is there. There are, there are many young children and the future is good if you educate them properly, which is a different issue that I have with my decision makers in the country. But that's besides the point. So we have um, young people, 27%. Working. Working is between uh, 15 and 64. I, this is the UN standards, 15 uh, years old to 64. And old people, uh, 11%. So not very many people work. 62% is OK, but it's not, it's not ideal. But the hope is there, 27% young people. South Korea. 
This is the pyramid. What you see here is that there are less and less children every year per family. It's a shrinking society. So right now, many people work. Okay? This is the group age that work. So economy is good. Everybody is happy. But not enough children. And, and young people do not consider a family a necessity or having children as essential. They don't see it this way. They don't get married young. They have 1.25 children per a family. So the future is um, sort of bleak, uh, not, not very good. Not, who, I, I talk to these people and I say, who will support you when, you when you get old? Nobody will work. So they have a problem. This is a demographic problem and it has to be solved. Now, l let's talk a little bit about why, why did it happen in South Korea and in many other countries. In the 50s, there were six children per family on the average. 50s and 60s. The Korean government was very worried and they started to advocate one family, one child. Like in China. In China it's very famous, but South Korea did the same thing. One family, one child. Okay, so people say, oh, okay, less children, good. This is one factor. This can be changed. Government policies can be changed. But there are two other factors that cannot be changed and should not be changed. And these are the following. Number one, urbanization. People move from the village to the city. In the village you have six children, in the city you have one, two. Now, you don't want to change that. Urbanization is good, this is where the society is moving, and that's okay. Factor number two is education for women. Uneducated women have many children, she has many children. Educated woman who wants a career will not have many children, which is good. You have a women's career is excellent. People, women are educated. That's good. You don't want to change urbanization. You don't want to change education for women. These are two good processes. But you do need to change government policies. And the, these governments, the South Korean government, did not catch what's happening on time. You know, when you control a process, as you reach a limit, you start to control it. You don't wait it. To, to shoot up, right? You, you control it, right? Everybody knows that. This is what I studied when I studied mechanical engineering, controlling processes, okay? As you approach, you start to control it. They didn't do that. They continue to advocate one child, one child per family. So only recently they said, oh, what are we doing? No, we should advocate many children per family. And they start to do it. Many countries do something about it. In Russia, which has the same problem, Russia has a terrible problem. They will give two years of maternity leave. Two years with salary. Please have a child. We'll give you two years of maternity leave. In Scandinavia, men and women can decide who will get the maternity leave. And so on. Countries do something about it. But uh, it's too late. It's too slow. And this, this has to be corrected. They need to advocate. It. I had a... Uh, a conversation with the president of, uh, of Taiwan. My watch is a gift from the president of Taiwan. And, and I talked to him about the demographic problems of Taiwan. They have the same, the same problem in Taiwan. Even worse than South Korea, it's about 1.1 children per, per family. And he said that he's trying to do something about it. I will not disclose the, uh, the whole conversation, but, but it's, it's a real problem. So this is what happened in South Korea. Look at the dates. These are the dates. This is the year um, 55 to 65. Six children per woman. Whoops, down to 1.25 within a short period of time because of these three processes that I have mentioned. OK, um, so what can you do? Let, let's uh, skip this cartoon. We don't have time for that. So one of the solutions is um, entrepreneurship. People should think about opening businesses in this way, encouraging societies. I meet many young people in the world during my travels. And let me tell you about one such experience. I met peop young people from Spain. And I talked to them about what's happening in Spain today. 
And they said, oh, we have a terrible government. They do not provide jobs. This is awful. I said, wait, why do you think that the government has to give you a job? The government has to create conditions in which jobs are formed. But the government does not provide jobs, unless for some you know, government workers. But, and they say, well, this is, we are expecting our government to solve the problem. I said, no. You think about something that you can do good, that you can do well, something you can produce, or the services you can give, and open your own business. Start small. Open it. Take care of yourself. Think about yourself. Now, I'm speaking about it in the United States of America. This is the birthplace of entrepreneurship in the world, right? But I come from a country which is the same thing. In Israel, we have the same spirit as, as we have here in the United States. People are very entrepreneurial. And, and uh, they say, no, we wait until the government provides us jobs. They don't have any future this way. They have to, the government has to foster uh, entrepreneurship. Okay. So how can, we, um, how can we build sustainable economy and develop human ingenuity? How can we do that? So there are several conditions to that. Number one is good basic education to all. Every word is important. It has to be good education, and it has to be for all. Not the, just the city dwellers, the people in the villages. It's more important to educate the people in the villages, in many countries in the world, because they have the children, and they are the future. So we need to provide good education, good basic education for all, so that they will have a chance to progress from there. Okay, now what? Good engineering and science education. Because engineers and scientists, these are the people that open the startups. So we need to make as many as we can of this type of people, okay? So we need good universities, you need good support for universities, and in particular universities that develop these medical doctors, biologists, engineers, and so on, the people who open startups. This is the shortest way to reach the people who will open startups. Let's say that somebody opens a startup after he graduates from university, maybe five years later. Well, he will graduate at age uh, 22 or something, or in Israel it's 25. And, and then he will work with somebody for several years to develop his ideas, and then he, will open, he or she will open a startup. So the shortest way to open a startup is educate these would be engineers and scientists and medical doctors and biologists and computer experts reach these people first because they, this is the frontier of the future entrepreneurs. Next, government policy and support. Governments has great power. I do not advocate too much government involvement uh, in uh, people's life in general and in uh, especially in uh, making startups. But governments should provide conditions in which startups can thrive. What governments can do, we'll talk about it a little bit later. There will be one page dedicated to that. But government can do great things to foster uh, entrepreneurship and to enable young people to open startups and have a chance of success. Number four, free market economy. When I talk in the United States about free market economy, you say, mm, well, of course, yes, yeah, free market economy, sure, why not? But there are countries in which they don't have free market economy. In Russia, if you want to open uh, a store to sell flowers, you have to have about 20 licenses. And if you want each one of them be signed by the right official, you have to pay for it. And people don't have enough money to pay for the license to open a barber shop or a flower shop or anything. So that's not the way to build economy. And last but not least is not, no corruption. Corruption kills economies, corruption kills startups, corruption is very bad, it should be, we cannot kill corruption because it's human nature of some people, 
but we have to limit it. And, and government policies can do great to curb this terrible phenomenon of corruption. There are countries that, that everything goes by corruption. Sometimes small things, sometimes big things. The leaders hoard billions upon billions, and people remain, remain poor and disenchanted, and then they revolt, and then there are wars, and so on. So this is it. This is what we need to do. But that may not be enough. Let's say that we have all that. Let's say that we have good education, good engineering, government policy is fine, free market economy, no corruption. South Korea has all this. And nobody opens startups there. Huh? Why? All the conditions are perfect. Wonderful education. I talk about South Korea because I'm there, but the many countries are like this. In fact, I like South Korea. I think it's a wonderful country. And if you visit Seoul, you'll see that it's one of the greatest, greatest capitals in the world. But they don't open startups. That because that may not be enough. Also needed is development of entrepreneurial spirit and knowledge. Two things. Knowledge. Knowledge means how do I open a startup? How do I get an idea? How do I start? What do I do? Where do I go? What? What? How do I open a startup? This is knowledge, okay? Where the stepping stones are? Where are the stumbling blocks? What should I do? What should I not do? Whom do I turn for advice? So this is the, um, this is the, sp the knowledge. Now, the spirit is a different thing. Spirit is something very elusive. It happens, and, and it's in the air, and suddenly you realize that every young man and woman wants to open startup, whether they can, whether they cannot. And they think highly about somebody who does open a startup. Okay? The Jewish mother in the past wanted her son or daughter to be a doctor. Now they want them to be entrepreneurs, at least in my country. Open a startup, my son. What are you sitting here? <laughs> Go and open a startup already. Huh? Okay, this is the spirit. It's in the air. People talk about it. People feel that it is great to open a startup. People envy people, somebody who succeeded. They want to be like him. These people are role models. This is the spirit. So knowledge and spirit of entrepreneurship, this can be done. Now, some people say that you have to be born entrepreneur to become entrepreneur. It means the following, if your father had a, a factory a, and you help him uh, there from a young age and you, you are born into a family of entrepreneurs, they speak the language of entrepreneurship at home, so you will become an entrepreneur. But our fathers, most of them, were not like this. They were at best professors in university and, and most of them were not. So most of us were not born to such family. Doesn't, does it mean that we cannot be entrepreneur? Not at all. Not so. While it is true that home environment can affect ideas, mentality, and self-efficacy, self-efficacy is trusting yourself, believing in yourself that, that I can do it, I can make it. Right? It is also true that proper teaching can direct attention to worthy subject, and a good mentor we'll mention mentors later on, can inspire enthusiastic followers. Mentors are very important. Figures to follow. Can we teach technological entrepreneurship? Yes, we can, and we should. So who teaches technological entrepreneurship today? You go to universities in the United States, the Ivy League University, all these great names, MIT, Harvard, uh, Stanford, Princeton, um, Northwestern. And you ask, do you teach technological entrepreneurship? And the answer is usually, <laughs> are you kidding? <laughs> we are the best of the best. <laughs> now, wait a minute. Where do you teach it? Oh, in MBA programs. OK. So what you teach is how to manage a startup, which is wonderful. But these people do not open startups. They will be excellent managers. But they don't open startups. You should talk to the people who would open a startup in their future. Okay. 
So we can skip that. So who opens startup? It is engineers, biologists, MD, scientists, computer experts. This type of people, these are the people that start new high-tech company. And we should catch them when they are still young in the university and encourage them to think about their future as entrepreneurs. Universities have a key role in this because these young people who would open startups in the future are captive audience. They are here. Okay, talk to them. So, whom and where should we teach? And number one, youth in high schools. In Israel, there are many high school programs, mostly done by volunteers, but huge number of young people are exposed to entrepreneurship. They do projects in high school. They invent a product as teams or individuals. They make the products. They learn how to register IPs or patents. Uh, they learn how to open a company. What do you do if you want to open a company? With one little form that you fill in, you send it to the government somewhere, and you add, I don't know, 200 shekels to this, which is $50 or something, and you have a company. That's it. So, but you have to, to go through the process. You have to know that it is done. And, and then they try to sell their products. These are simple products, but some of them succeed in selling them, and they are an example to other young people. They think entrepreneurship at a very early age of high school. That's excellent. Now, number two, of course, in universities like Northwestern, teach engineers, scientists, MDs in universities. Talk about entrepreneurship in universities. And don't forget the technicians. These are the people that can make things. These are people in vocational schools. These are um, people that in the future will be able to make things. They can be great entrepreneurs making things. OK. So let me tell you about my class at the Technion, Technological Entrepreneurship, the Technion class. This is a class that, as I said, I started 27 years ago. What, what is the background? Why, why did I start this? a class which is away from my expertise or anything else. It is because of the following. When I was a student at the Technion, they, the spirit of the Technion was, it was in the air. The Technion told us, you will be so good that when you graduate, everybody will want to hire you. And I said, OK, this is wonderful, but what if I want to open a new company, the word startup was, did not exist at the time. If I want to open a new little company that will make things, how do I do that? The Technion did not teach it at all. I did nothing. It, we were, the exposure to this was zero. We were good in science, we were good in technology, nothing about entrepreneurship or anything related to that. So when I received, when I, mean, I became a tenured full professor, the year was 1986, I said, okay, now I can do whatever I want. And I invented this class for the benefit of our future graduates. And I did not have any example how to do it. And I thought, I'm telling you because you may want to start it, so I, I'll, I'll take you through the process that, that I underwent. So, I said, OK, who, whom do I want to teach? They would be entrepreneurs. I looked at people at the foreheads. It didn't say I'm going to be an entrepreneur. How do I know who would be an entrepreneur? So the idea was to maximum exposure, right? Broadcast, maximum exposure. And, and those that will catch, they will catch. They will be infected by the bug of entrepreneurship. OK. Now, you know very well that when you start a new class in a university, you don't advertise it usually. It will be five lines in the university catalog. And if you are lucky, you will have 10 students in the first year, and then maybe 20, and 
I said, no, no, no. <laughs> I want many. I said, how do I do it? And I tell myself, OK, you want to teach entrepreneurship? Be one, right? How do you attract? How do you sell a product? You have a product. I want to sell it to everybody. How do you do that in university? I asked myself. The answer came very quickly. I called the head of the students' union to my office, and I said to him, hey, I have something fantastic for the future of the students of the Technion. Something that is designed for you, not for the Technion, for you. Which is, of course, nonsense to use polite words, but this is advertising, right? OK. <laughs> and he said, oh, yes, sir, what can I do for you? I said, OK, you have a weekly journal that you give for free to everybody. I want you to advertise this class in your weekly journal. He said, yes, sir. What should I write? I said, you will write it. You know the students. You will write something. Come show me, and I will approve it. Comes back the next day with a centerfold of the magazine saying, you want to become an entrepreneur? In Hebrew. You don't know how? Come to this class of entrepreneurship. 600 students registered because this was the limit. The Churchill Auditorium at the Technion had 600 seats. But many more wanted to come to listen. They couldn't register. They came anyway. <laughs> they sat on the stairs, like these gentlemen here. But there were 200 of them on the stairs. It was really dangerous. <laughs> I had 800 students, 600 registered. Everybody came. OK, can I teach entrepreneurship? Definitely not. What do I know about entrepreneurship? <laughs> but I know the people who know something about entrepreneurship. And these are the people who made it already. So I invited, invited speakers to talk about entrepreneurship. The first person that I have invited, his name is Steph Wertheimer. He is the father of entrepreneurship in the country. I came to visit him in Teffen, where he had his wonderful Iska factory. And uh, I said to him, hey, you know, you are the father of entrepreneurship. I'm opening this class. Please come and give the opening talk in my class. Tell about your experience. Tell about how you started. And give some hints to the students. I will not detail the conversation that we had. It was not easy, but he came and gave the opening talk. Next, I turn to another entrepreneur. His name is Uzia Galil. He opened another high-tech company that then there were many companies under his control. And then Yuda Bronitsky, another one who opened. There were three, four, five entrepreneurs in Israel at the time. I invited them all. And then I started to call other people. And they said, OK, so you open a new class. Good. Who was there already? Did somebody speak for you already? I said, yeah, yeah, you know, Steph was here, and Uziah Galil was here. No, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. <laughs> for 27 years, one person refused to come to my class. One person. Now, bear in mind, these people, these, these are billionaires. These people, every day of their life, worth a lot of money. If they are away from the office, it's expensive. And although they have to speak one hour, they spend the day coming and going. It's, it's a whole day. Not only do they do it willingly, it's sometimes embarrassing because the secretary calls me and says, hey, Danny, how are you doing? I said, fine. You know, uh, my boss asks, when do you want him this year? What is the date? And he's not on my program this year. Well. So sometimes it's embarrassing. Say, oh, you know, this year we have a different chair. Next year, of course. <laughs> In the first year, I prepared some money to pay their expenses. Maybe they'll take a taxi. Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> but when they started to come with the private helicopters, I understood that that, that is not really necessary. <laughs> OK, so this was, this was the beginning. So how does it work? First of all, it's open to all Technion students. Any undergraduate student can take it. Um, graduate students can take it too. It's open, but uh, they do not get a point. They will get one academic point for it only. And it's also, it's interesting, 
people who retired from the jobs come to the Technion to listen to these classes, they think about, hey, you know, I'm retired, maybe I'll open a startup. So they come to listen to this talk. As a curiosity, there was one lady who was sitting in the corner, she's about 50 years old, and she came to each and every, class, each and every class. And so one day, I, and at the end of the class, she disappeared. So one day I caught her and I said, why are you here? And she looks at me and says, are you kidding? That's the best show in town. <laughs> it is. <laughs> OK, three to six hundred students in the class. I mentioned that all lectures by invited speakers. These are the following. First group is successful entrepreneurs. These are the people who made it big time. They know how to do it. They give good advices to the students, and they are the role models. These are the role models to follow. I want to be like him, or I want to be like her. Second group are new startup entrepreneurs. These are people that opened a startup two years ago, three years ago. They're still fighting, they're, and they tell us about the problems they have, and about the achievements they have, and so on and so forth. And you listen to them, and each one has a different problem. Somebody doesn't have enough money. Another one has a lot of money, but he cannot find the right people to have him, to help him. Another one has a product now, and it's difficult to sell the product, and, and so on and so forth. And they, the students can identify with them, because number one, many of them are graduates from my class, and number two, it's almost the same age group. These are, these are people about their age, so that they can really identify with them. Group number three are professionals. So who are the professionals? I bring a lawyer to tell the students how to register a company and why you should register a company, limited company, and not take the financial burden on your narrow shoulders. Right? How to do that? I bring somebody, uh, they talk about market survey. You should be an expert in your market, otherwise you have no chance of succeeding. You should know the competition, you should know the progress they make, you should follow the market. Daily, be an expert in your market. So I talk about, mar this is market survey. I talk about marketing, not I. I invite somebody that talks about marketing. Okay, so you have a product. How do you sell it? What do you do? What do companies do to sell their products? Giving many examples of how people do it the right way. I bring somebody that talks about <coughs> the patent law, the patent law. In fact, I bring the patent officer of the country to talk about uh, the, how do you register a patent? Should you register? Where do you register? Is it provisional in the United States? Is it the Far East? Where do you direct your product? Is it local? So these are the professionals. OK. So an invited speaker, entrepreneur, should provide tips, tell stories, give advice from his or her experience. Tell stories. People love stories. And they remember the stories more than anything else. If they can learn from the story, it's wonderful. So these people tell, say how they started. And all these successful entrepreneurs started from nothing. They had hungry families, literally hungry families, when they started. And now, OK. These entrepreneurs are role models to follow. This is what I want. I want them. I want the students to identify with them. I want the students to say, wow, I, I want to be like him. And if he started from zero, so can I. OK. If the audience can identify with the speaker, can believe that they can follow his or her footsteps and become successful story, we have achieved our goal in this class. So what can an experienced invited to the Purdue talk about? How he started, he or she started. And, um, and they do it very well. They tell the story, how they started from the, They're so happy to tell the stories. It's wonderful. The speakers enjoy the class more than anybody else in the class. I mean, they really enjoy coming there. They wait for it year after year. How they started. Difficulty he or she faced and ways uh, he overcame them. What were the financial resources? You hear very funny stories, very funny stories, who were the sources. Let me tell you a little story. Right? One very successful entrepreneur needed money for his uh, startup at the time. He went to the local butcher 
The local butcher, the old days in Israel, uh, there was a black market in, in meat because there was not enough of it. So butchers were rich people, but they could not spend the money that they hoarded because everybody was watching them. And so the butcher, local butcher, gave him a lot of money in those, those days for 50% of the company. And the company became very successful. And the company was worth billions of dollars, and it was private, and it belonged to two people, <laughs> the man that started and the butcher. <laughs> and so the butcher one day wakes up, and he sees the, his worth. He takes his shares and sells it to a holding company, big holding company in Israel. So now, instead of having a dormant partner, this entrepreneur has an active partner. And that um, holding company is a public company. So they need to disclose the revenues. He did, not, he did not want to disclose his revenues. And as a private owner, he didn't have to do that. But now, somebody tells his story. And suddenly, all the world knows how much money he makes on each product. Why doesn't he sell it less expensively if it's so easy to make them and so on and so on? Why does he charge so much? He doesn't like this way. So he turns to the company that holds 50% and says, please, you know, this is the, the venture of my life. It's, it's, it's my life story. Please sell it to me. Sell the other half to me. And the company says, are you kidding? We make so much money from you. We are not selling you anything. OK, he said, no problem. And he starts to buy shares of the holding company. <laughs> and very quickly, the holding company realizes that he will own them. So they call him and say, um, what, what was that? What did you want when you called? He said, I want to buy my shares. He said, OK. So he bought his shares, and then his profits are not disclosed. OK, this is one story, but, but there are many, many of them. And we remember them. How do they find proper partners? Proper partners is a major issue. If you have partners, they should be proper partners. We'll talk about it in a few minutes. How do they find customers? What is the company culture? Company culture? Yeah, very important company culture. Let me give you an example. There's one company in Israel who produced the chips for printing machines that you attach to your computer. Right? The chip, the brain, they produce the brains. And then one day they realize, they realize that they have a bug in the chip. And in certain rare, very rare cases, the printer may not function properly. So now, and they fix it. But now, by now they sold millions of them. And the question now is, should we tell the customers that all their printers have a bug in it? And it probably never happened that somebody will realize that they have a bug in it, but, but we, you know, we didn't do a good job. Should we tell these companies or forget it? And when they have a problem, they will turn to us and say, hey, what's going on? They had, and now, if they tell the companies, they, they may lose customers. And these are huge customers. If they don't tell, that's bad too. So what? Bad too if it is discovered. So what do you do? They decided to tell the companies and risk losing some of them. The companies, all of them, appreciated it. And they said, OK, thank you. We realized how difficult it was for you to tell us this problem. Fix it. They said, oh, we fixed it already. And thank you for sharing it. Let's hope that nothing happens. And nothing happened. This is company culture. You have to decide sometime tough decisions. Just one little example of tough decisions that you may want to, that you may have to make. Cultural consideration. OK. It goes together with fear of failure. There are societies, mainly in the Far East, in which failure is considered 
shame. Shame on you, shame on your family, shame on your city. You, shame is the worst thing that can happen to you. Many people commit suicide because they did something which brought shame on them and on their families. And we teach our students, and I tell, my, I tell everybody, mainly in the Far East, but also in Europe, failure is okay. Start again. This sentence is very important. In fact, somebody in China invited me to give this lecture, but he said, but I want the title to be Failure is okay, start again. It's a change of culture. It is very difficult to do. Changing culture is very difficult. But people have to understand that most startups fail. And it's okay. I tell people, now that you have failed, if I need to invest in somebody, I will invest in you rather than in a rookie. Because you are because you are an experienced entrepreneur. You are an experienced entrepreneur. I trust you more than I trust a novice, somebody who doesn't know anything about it, right? Failure is okay, start again. I realize that it is very difficult. The United States and Israel, we don't have that. Failure is not considered a shame in our societies. It's okay, we start again. It's not a shame on us or on, on our family. Okay, many failed, I failed, I start again. I have a better chance next time. Right? So speaking about it here sounds, okay, big deal. But in some society, they don't have startups because of this point, because of this uh, fear of failure and the shame that may come with it. So this is fear of failure. Government role. Let's take a little bit about government role. Incubators. Governments can open incubators. Now, when I say government, I mean government in the broad term. It can be the federal government, the state government, the city government, the university government. Somebody that has the power to open an incubator should open incubator. These are places, for those of you who don't know what they are, uh, practically, it's a building uh, divided into, let's say, 10 parts. Uh, each, each hall is so many square uh, feet. And companies can work there. They are brought in. They are given um, office um, help. And not only office, but advice from, from a lawyer and advice from somebody in marketing. And so they are given support. And they're given money. And in Israel, they give them about half a million dollars for two years to show feasibility and find investors. They have two years to find investors. If they are successful and find investors, it is considered success. And governments should open these uh, incubators. I know very well that in the United States there are many incubators like this in universities, in other places, and so it is uh, in Israel. In other countries, this is not usually the case. So incubators, free PC protection. Hmm. Wait till people start to write me on Skype. Hey, Danny, good morning, good evening. <laughs> Very embarrassing. OK. Um, partnership. Partnership with VC funds. In the mid 80s, when I opened my class, there was one venture capital in Israel. One. And it was, yes, there was capital there, but no venture. They invested only in something that was sure to succeed. I invited the CEO of that venture capital fund to talk in my class. And he talked to my class. The next year, I was looking for somebody else, still one. Now the year is 1987. He came again and talked in my class. The third year, still one. He said, take my son. I had enough of you to talk about. And then at the, towards the end of the 80s, the government of Israel did the following. They said to the world, hey, guys, can't invest, invest in Israel. 
we are partners. You invest 60%, we invest 40%. We take 40% of the risk on us. Within one year, there was huge amount of money that started to flow in because the government took a good part of the risk. And huge amount of money. And many startups started starting at that time. This was the end of the 80s. So this was a very clever move of our government. Not all the moves that our government do is clever, but this one was. And, uh, and the end result, you will be uh, interested to learn, is that after several years, the, the government was not needed there, so they, they sold their share, the 40% of all the investors. So all in all, they invested $100 million. That's all. And brought billions of dollars in investment. And they gained, and they took, when, once they sold their shares, they got $140 million. In about five years, they made 40%. Not bad for governments to make such good money, right? OK, so partnership with VC funds around the world. Form chief scientist office in every ministry. In Israel, we have chief scientist office in every ministry. This is the person who can talk to the scientists or the entrepreneurs and can talk to the government. He's an intermediate. You cannot reach the minister, but you can reach him easily. So you can talk to him, and, and he, he talks to both parts. So this is the bridge between government. Government, again, general government, federal, state, city. And OK. Government can support industrial innovation, R&D, in startups by, by giving money to worthy uh, startups. And, uh, Many governments do that. Uh, in Israel, we do that all the time. The chief scientist in Israel, uh, we call him chief scientist. Well, every ministry has a chief scientist, but one of the chief scientists has a lot of money. So we call him the chief scientist, and he supports the startups. Signed uh, by national agreements and support by national funds, this is um, something like this. Um, this, is, this, this work very well between Israel and the United States. A startup can develop wonderful product, but what they lack is the market. And here you have a great American company who has the market, and they don't have this product. So they can form partnership. Uh, it will be produced by the Israeli company and sold by the American company. And this, this is a good, good partnership. Strategic partners are excellent. Form and support instruction and advice centers for emerging startups. These are advice centers. In every city in Israel, you find these things. These are offices. Uh, if you are a young uh, startup manager and you have problems, you can go there and get advice. Usually, it's free. Sometimes you have to pay some money, but, but a small amount, for a professional uh, advice. And, and it works very well. And you'll be surprised to learn that these offices are sometimes occupied by people who were great entrepreneurs, did very well, and now they have retired. And they, they really want to contribute to the society by educating young entrepreneurs. They do it voluntarily. It's wonderful. It works very well. But the government has to establish uh, this, uh, this office. VC funds. I have a problem with VC funds. Uh, they are essential to, they are essential to, for startups, they are a good source of money, but there's a problem there. They, uh, you know how venture capital funds work? I will, I will brief you in, in a couple of minutes just for the young people in the back. Um, there's a, a person who says, okay, I open a venture capital fund. Invest in my venture capital fund, give me a million dollars. And I will invest your million dollars wisely because I am expert in a certain market. I will invest it in, in biotechnology or in um, micro uh, something. And, and after five years or so, you will get your money back with a profit. And I will get a salary for my service. Right? This is venture capital fund. So people invest in them. And what they really want is to get their money back with the gains as soon as possible. So usually, after five or, at the best case, seven years, the venture capital fund will come to the 
startup manager and say, okay, you know, uh, we'll have to sell you now because we need our money back to pay the investors. Five years is not enough time for a startup to really succeed. And, and then what happens is that they sell the startup, a large company will buy it, they will take the IP, will send the people home, and that's bad. So they, it, it go, if, if I ask them to give 10 years, they said, <laughs> you know, we have to pay our investors. They're not willing to wait for 10 years. And I say to them, okay, why do you need to give your investors money? Give them shares in the companies, right? Maybe they will agree to that. Don't destroy the startup, let it, let it grow. So this is the problem I have with venture capital funds, but they are a good source of money uh, anyway. Okay. So where should we go to seek funding for our startups? I'm sorry, I'll finish in five minutes. Um, this is what we advise our students. Number one, strategic partners. These are companies that will sell your product, will make partnership. You will make the product, they will sell your product. This is wonderful. They will invest in you so that your product is up to their standards or is exactly to what they can sell. And this is good source of money. Angels. Angels are people with deep pockets that are willing to invest in you because they were, why do they have deep pockets? Because they sold their startups and pocketed a couple hundred million dollars and now they want to invest it in something in their own field. They are expert in a the field. They will foster and invest in young company in the same field. And these are good investors because they can give you good advice. Money should come with something else attached to it. Other selling your product or giving you good advice or guiding you. Don't take just the money. You need a, an added value to this. Bootstrapping. Bootstrapping is no money. So how do you open a company without any money? A student asked me that. And he said, okay, let me give you an example. Let's say that you develop a biological pro, uh, something biology. Right? And uh, you need a computer uh, expert to help you in developing the product. So find one and uh, tell him or her, hey, I, I need your help uh, during the weekends. I want you to work for me. I cannot pay you, but I give you part of my company. Right? I give you shares in my company. And I'm telling the students at this point in your career, the worth of your company is exactly zero. Be generous about this zero so that everybody will be happy. If you are successful, there will be enough money for everybody. Everybody will be happy. Right? This is bootstrapping. And VC funds are last on my list. What money we should not, we should not take? I tell them there are two kinds of money you don't want to touch. Number one, if you don't have deep pockets, deep, I'm sorry. Double E. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> do not use your own. Do not use your own money. Don't don't touch your own money. Don't sell your apartment. Don't sell your car, because you are, you are, you are liable to lose your apartment, your car, and your family. I mean, don't don't do that. Don't use your own money. You don't have enough money for that. And do not take money from relatives or friends. Your aunt uh, will uh, approach you two weeks after she gave you the money, and she said, "Well, how are you doing?" Are we, are we making already money? Oh, no, you know, uh, it will take several, several years? Well, I don't know. So, because you are liable to, <laughs> to lose your friends uh, or, or family. Okay, entrepreneurship. A couple of words about entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship meaning opening a company within an existing company. I'll give you an example. There's a company in Israel called RAD, R-A-D. Uh, it, is, uh, it was opened by two brothers, technical graduates, uh, Yuda and Zohar Zisapel. And it, it does microelectronics, different things in, in electronics and microelectronics. They build gadgets. They have a rule in the company that if somebody, a bench scientist or an engineer has an idea, he can approach the owner. He does not have to go through the steps of command, through the chain of command. He doesn't have to talk to his boss. He can go directly up there. 
and tell, the, and tell the owner, hey, I have this wonderful idea. What do you think? Can I, can I develop it with you? The owner will check it, and he will say, if positive, he will say, okay, I'll give you five people. I'll give you these two offices at the end of the corridor. Please report to me every quarter, and at the end of the year, we'll check the progress. I'll give you also money for the salaries and for all the equipment that you need to buy. He goes to the end of the corridor, reports every quarter. If successful, then this, young, this group branches out of the big company. They open a new company, and the people with the idea have a share in it, and the owner has a share in it. This is, this is how they branch out. By now, this company has more than 100 small companies. Some of them grew larger than, than the mother company. It's excellent, but it's based on one important thing. Direct contact between the bench scientist and the CEO. You can knock on his door or call his secretary and say, I want an appointment with the big boss because I have an idea. Because what happens in other countries where you cannot do that is you talk to your own boss, the group leader. Okay? The group leader will say, hmm, my team is wonderful. By now, it's mine. It's my team. Right? So the idea is mine. He goes to his boss and says, oh, look what an idea my team and I have. His boss will say, hmm, that's really a good idea. My people have wonderful ideas. Now it's mine. By the time it reaches the big boss, the Ben scientist is forgotten and he will have nothing. So they don't talk. They keep, they keep it secret. They don't want to tell their ideas. And these ideas are lost. Bad news. Break the chain of command. Allow people to talk freely from the, from the production floor to the big boss. It's a cultural thing. It can be done in Israel. I know it can be done somehow in the United States. Introducing science to young people. I'll tell you about three projects that I do, and I'll tell you why I do that, and we'll finish with that. I, say, I told you that the, the shortest way from education to startup is teaching the people in universities. But you teach the engineers and the scientists, and there would be scientists, and there would be biologists, and so on and so on, computer experts. But we need more people who would want to become engineers and scientists. So my idea was that if you want somebody to like engineering and to see himself as a scientist and so on, you have to start teaching them at a very early age. I was on a television program in Israel, and I said exactly that in Hebrew. The mayor of Haifa hears me, and he calls me right after the program, and he said, Danny, did you say young children? How young? I said, well, kindergarten. He said, science to kindergarten children? I said, of course. Young children are extremely bright. They are not retarded adults. They are very, very bright. A young child learns the language within one year. When a child is one year old, he doesn't speak. When he's two years old, he doesn't stop speaking. One year. Now you try learning a language in one year. I cannot do that. They do it like that. They, their minds are so bright. Yes, let's teach it in kindergarten. He said, okay, are you willing to do it in Haifa? Haifa is my hometown where the Technion is. I said, are you supporting it financially? Not for salary for me. I, for me, I volunteer, but, but you have to build an organization. He says, I will support it. So we started a program in which it's a pilot. We have 60, 60 kindergartens, in which a group of scientists teaches the kindergarten teachers science. They convey it to the young people. Successful? Partially. The problem is that the minds of the kindergarten teachers is not as bright as the mind of the young children. And they find it sometimes difficult to convey the messages. So, it's, it's working, but it's not a grand success. So I say to myself after a year, OK, how do I overcome this obstacle, and how do I teach more children than there are 60 kindergartens in Haifa? Television. Television. Everybody watches television, right? So by the way, do you know why television is called medium? Anybody? Because it is neither rare, nor is it well done. So approaching, 
<laughs> approaching a, um, we have educational television, a national educational television. Okay, so I approached them, I presented my, my idea, I said, hey, I want to teach everybody on television science. And uh, would you do it? I prepared a talk of 20 minutes. After 20 seconds, the boss says, okay, we do it. Just, just, we do it. Don't tell me anything. I understand. Let's do it. And so they built for me on the set a laboratory, sort of something that looks like a laboratory. And I have a lab assistant. And we'll bring in three children, first graders, right? six, six, six and a half years old. And we talk science to them. And it's not rehearsed. It's the first time, I don't talk to them about it before. This is the first time I meet them. I know what I want to talk about. And we converse. We converse, we do conversation about science. And there are demonstrations and, and all kinds of things. And, and uh, my, my um, lab uh, assistant tells a story, relevant. Remember stories? People like stories? They she tells a see, lady, she tells a story which is relevant and so on. It is not hoo-ha science, not liquid nitrogen and bubbles and, and smoke and chemicals changing colors. No. Only things that they can understand. Quantitative values. How do you measure? Phenomena like gravity, magnetism. It's very difficult to explain to a young child what is a gravitation field. Uh, okay, so you hold something with a string, you pull up, who pulls down? I mean, what was going on? Right? Explaining field, it's not, it's not easy. And so on and so forth. Different physical phenomena that it's part of their lives and I wanted their eyes to open. How do you measure temperature? What is temperature? Uh, what is a crystal? How are atoms arranged in a crystal? At one point, I brought 36 young children. They were atoms, and we staged them, and, and they were atoms, and, and so it's wonderful. This, I made, about up to now, I made 10 programs uh, on physics, and next are 10 programs on earth sciences, and next are 10 programs on biology. This, I didn't do that yet, but physics, I finished. And it is on air every day, every day, including weekends, three times a day. Three times a day, every day, and the children love to watch it. Of course, it's, it's, it's repeating itself, but the children love to watch it ten times the same thing. They remember it by heart. They really love it. It's, it's like, you know, young children, some of you have young children, maybe young grandchildren. They love you to read them the same story time and again. Do you, really, do you know this? They really like to hear it again and again. They know every word, but they still like to hear it again. Same here. They like to see it. Okay, so these are the programs, and you, know, you may know this book, um, Israel Became a Startup Nation, and it became a startup nation within the last quarter century, and this is the time that I have been teaching my class. Now, I have a part in this uh, success story uh, in Israel. Okay, thanks very much. <laughs>